All right, bear with us as we make a few adjustments to everything, guys. And welcome to those watching on Facebook Live. Sorry, that's all you get to see is me now. <laughs> Let's see, I don't know, where's that best at? Right there, probably. How are we looking over there, Paul? Well, we got the yep. speaker. Speaker's on. All right, guys, grab your Bibles to Luke 22. Luke 22. And as you're turning there, let's pray. Father, we love you. We thank you for your incredible love for us, Lord. Lord, we thank you that um, although we may drift, Lord, although we are, we are prone to wander, your love is greater than that. It's no match for our wanderings, Lord. We thank you for it. We thank you that your mercies are new every morning. And fathers, we open your word and we talk about Peter and his fall and ultimately his restoration, Lord. May it just encourage us. May it challenge us, Lord, not to fall. And then if we have fallen, Lord, may it encourage us to know that we can get back up and keep going for you. So, Lord, we love you and it's in your name we pray. Amen. All right, guys, grab your Bibles. And uh, Luke 22, let's, let's read a little bit, starting in verse 54. Having arrested him, they led him and brought him into the high priest's house. But Peter followed at a distance. Now when they had kindled a fire in the midst of the courtyard, sat down together, Peter sat among them. And a certain servant girl, seeing him as he sat by the fire, looked intently at him and said, this man was also with him, but he denied him, saying, Woman, I do not know him. And after a little while, another saw him and said, You, are, you also are of them. But Peter said, Man, I am not. Then after about an hour had passed, another confidently affirming, saying, Surely this fellow also was with him, for he is Galilean. But Peter said, Man, I do not know what you are saying. Immediately, while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed. And the Lord turned and looked at Peter. And Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said to him, Before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And so Peter went out and wept bitterly. Powerful portion of scripture. Of course, what portion of scripture isn't powerful? But this one, to me, the drama is just so intense. The title of this message is Following at a Distance. And I know many of you guys have heard of John Newton. He was, before he was saved, a wild sailor, lived the sailor's life, did everything a sailor would be known to do. He was possibly most remembered for being a slave trader. And then after he got saved, he confessed, he repented and became a godly pastor. He's also known for writing many hymns. But one of his most favorite hymns is, of course, Amazing Grace. Towards the end of his life, when his memory was failing, he said he couldn't remember much, but he said, I remember two things, that I am a great sinner and that Christ is a great savior. And I don't know about you guys, but the longer I have been a Christian, the more clearly I see the wickedness in my own heart. The more clearly I understand why my savior had to go to the cross and suffer for my sins. And I don't know about you guys, but I too can say with John Newton that I am a great sinner and Christ is a great savior. And I can also relate with the person who wrote, Come Thou Fount, when he wrote, Oh to grace, how great a debtor, daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy goodness, like a feather, bind my wandering heart to thee. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart. Go oh, take it and seal it. Seal it for the courts above. No doubt about it. Just like John Newton, you and I are probably thinking the same way. The longer we've been believers, the more we see the wickedness of our hearts. But another truth also shines bright, doesn't it? We see that God is greater than the wickedness of our hearts. We see his grace shines through the ugliness of our sinfulness. 
And what a beautiful thing that is, is it not? Well, this morning we're going to look at the fall of Peter, but we're also going to see the restoration of Peter. And Peter is recognizing that he is a great savior, but he's also going to recognize that God is a great, excuse me, Peter recognizes he's a great sinner, but God is a greater savior. In this text, we will be exhorted and warned to make sure that we don't fall into the same trap at following God at a distance, so to speak. But we'll also be encouraged that when we have fallen, that his grace is greater than our capacity to sin. I don't know about you guys, but thank God for his amazing grace that we're going to celebrate today. Three main points this morning. The first one is the reason Peter denied knowing Jesus. The second one is the results of Peter's denial. The third point is the restoration of Peter. So let's set the stage. And our first main point, Pete, the reason Peter denied knowing Jesus. The stage is, and don't ever forget, as I as encourage you guys to, as we've been going through this, that you guys continue to read chapter 22 through 24 every week because the drama is just so intense to me. The stage is the Last Supper. They had just finished the Last Supper, or they're actually in the Last Supper and just finished it, went to the garden. Jesus is in the last week of his early life. And in that Last Supper, he was basically taking the Passover elements that they would celebrate, the Passover lamb. You guys are familiar with that the story of Moses freeing the people of Israel from Egypt. And they took the Passover lamb and they would celebrate that as covering their sins, releasing them from the bondage of Egypt. And Jesus was basically taking the elements and he was saying, this is me. He took the bread. He said, this is my body, which is broken for you. He took the cup and he said, this is my blood, which is shed for you. And I'm establishing a new covenant. We also know that in that upper room, what were they arguing about? They were arguing about who was going to be the greatest. They totally missed the moment. And we too can miss moments if we're not paying attention, if we're stuck on ourselves and our minds are focused on us. So they've left the upper room. They've gone to the Garden of Gethsemane, the Mount of Olives, which was his custom to do. And we should never, ever forget what we studied last week, the agony of that moment for Christ, that he wanted that cup to pass from him. He did not want to experience that cup, which wasn't death. Don't forget this. It was the wrath of God being poured upon him. That's what he did not want. He didn't want your sins and my sins poured upon him. And so he was in such agony that his sweat became as drops of blood. Let us never forget the agony of the Garden of Gethsemane. And we left last week with Jesus being arrested. He's going to end up having six phony trials, three with the Jewish leaders and three with the Roman leaders. Peter started to drift, and that's where we picked up our text today, right? He's been arrested and Jesus and Peter started following Jesus from a distance. Look, the biggest problem Peter had was he was self-confident. And in order to see that, the reason why Peter fell, you need to look back at Luke 22, verse 31 and 34. You guys remember this from a few weeks ago. Let's pick it up. If you if you just can look over there real quick and. The Lord said, Simon, Simon, indeed, Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. And when you have returned to me, strengthen your brethren. But listen to what Peter's response was. This is how we know it was self-confidence. But he said to him, Lord, I am ready to go with you both to prison and to death. Then he said, I tell you, Peter, the rooster shall not crow this day before you will deny me three times that you know me. Matthew gives a little bit more of this self-confidence that Peter had. And if you don't have your notes, turn to Matthew 26 and let's look at it. If you have your notes, it should be right there for you. Matthew 26, verse 33. And Peter answered and said to him, even if all are made to stumble because of you, I will never be made to stumble. And Jesus said, assuredly, I say to you that this night before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And Peter said to him, even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. And so said all the disciples. But listen to the boldness of Peter that he would make that. If all men deny you, I will not deny you, Lord. I'm going to stand with you, even if everybody else in this room doesn't want to. That's a lot of boldness. That's a lot of self-confidence, isn't it? I could just see him say, you called me rock earlier, and I'm going to be that rock for you, and nothing's going to change it. I'm going to be here for you. That was Peter's personality, was it not? Peter's personality was, hey, 
I'm going to just charge before I even think. I'm going to react before I even think. And he opened up his mouth and inserted foot many times in his ministry, didn't he? That's what happens with Peter's. Opening up their mouth before their brains can catch up. I can relate to this. I mean, I think we all can relate to this, can we not? How many times I wish I wouldn't have opened my mouth and inserted foot, but it does. It comes out. That's Peter's personality. And in some ways, I love this personality. You know why I love this personality? Because it's boldness. There's a boldness to it that just says, I'm ready to charge the hill. I'm ready for battle. Right? That's, that's the way I love. I love that personality that says, I, I, I'm ready to lean into it. I'm ready to lean forward. I'm not ready to cower back. I'm not, ready, ready, I'm not running, wanting to run away. I want to face the battle. So I love the boldness of Peter's personality. Hey, that boldness got Peter out of the boat when no one else was willing to get out of the boat. Remember? He's walking on the water. He got out and walked on the water. Now people have said, well, Peter failed. He took his eyes off the Lord and he lost faith. Well, yeah, he did, but at least he had the faith to get out of the boat. Where were the other guys? They're still sitting in the boat. See, that's Peter's boldness, and that's, the, that's, that's a great thing about his personality. He was willing to just go for it. He wasn't timid. He was, he was eager to do things for the Lord. But that other, the other side of that personality can bring trouble. As we just saw in the garden, when he pulled out the sword and he cut off the soldier's ear, no doubt he was aiming for his head um, and just missed. See, that, that personality, if he would have stayed up and prayed, we're going to talk about that in just a second. He wouldn't have reacted in the flesh that way. So there is a trouble and a downside to his personality. And that's that you want to bring out the sword. It's that self-confidence that wants to act before it thinks. It wants to act before it even prays. It needs to be tempered. So Peter's biggest problem was self-confidence. And he felt like it was his strongest area. You know, I'm, I, don't, I think he meant every word he said when he said it. I'm willing to go to death. I'm willing to go to the death. Self-confidence, but it became a weakness to him, didn't it? It really became his greatest weakness. And so the lesson we can learn from Peter and his self-confidence is, hey, what's the last sin you and I would ever think that we would commit? What is it? You know, I know the last sin I think I would ever commit. But we got to be careful because in that self-confidence, it actually becomes a weakness. Listen, the area of greatest vulnerability is the, sometimes the area in which we think we're the strongest, not the weakest. You see, we have a tendency to guard those areas that we think we're the weakest. Well, I know that that's, a, that's an area of temptation for me. I'm going to avoid everything, and I'm going to put up a fortress around that, and I'm going to make sure I don't go in that area. But then that area that I think I'm the strongest, oh, I leave a little hole in the wall. It's been said an unguarded strength is actually a double weakness. And this church is filled with examples of this. The Bible is filled with examples of this, of people who thought they were super strong in one area and fell. Let me just throw out to you Abraham. What was Abraham known for? A man of faith, wasn't he? What did he fall in? His faith. It was his strength, yet he fell in his faith. He lied about Sarah, not just once, but twice. You see, an unguarded strength can become a double weakness. Oh, you need another example? How about Samson? <laughs> Samson, who can rip lions apart with his bare hands, who was the strong, strongest of strongest of men. Yet, in that strength, he fell to a conniving woman. A strength can actually become a double weakness if we're not paying attention. Joshua. Another example, they entered into the promised land and they wiped out Jericho following the Lord's instructions to a T. Silly instructions that we might see, right, on a human level. Hey, march around the city and just go, duh, 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 and then trumpet the horn. And they won a great battle. But guess what that did? That brought them complacency. And when they went into AI after that, they were defeated. You see, we've got to make sure that we guard our strengths as well as our weaknesses. We don't want to be a self-assured man. A self-assured saint is of no value to God, is what Chambers has said. I'm going to quote that again in just a minute. 
Look, you know, I, 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 I'm so thankful in some ways. Believe me, we need to get back together as a church family and fill this sanctuary with people. But let's not forget to seize the moments. And seizing the moments is understanding that this, what has taken place, has actually brought the church down to what it basically needs to be doing. It's not about the stage. It's not about the steam. It's not about the great worship team. It's about simply the things that God has told us it's about, and that has made it very clear. It's not about our programs. The church has been brought down to just doing church through a computer screen. It boils down to, really what it boils down to is loving God, getting into prayer, getting into his word, and fellowshipping I, right now through Zoom, but hopefully soon face to face. So the good side of it is, is look, no matter how big somebody else's building is, everybody's equal right now because we're all talking to screens. And it's just taking it down to the base form in which it needs to be, and it should always be. It should never be about a building. A building can become idolatry. A program can become idolatry. A stage presentation becomes idolatry when it takes us away from the simplicity of just worshiping God, loving him, loving others, and being together, opening his word and praying. That's what it's all about. That's what it's all about. So, look, the biggest thing we can learn from Peter is to stay humble. Oswald Chambers, as I was studying this whole study, I just remembered this quote just bouncing in my head the whole week. As he said, a self-assured saint is of no value to God. I have no self-assurance. I have nothing in myself. I, I know that in myself, I am capable of driving my life into every single ditch that comes along, even the ones I don't think I'd ever drive in. I am, that's just who I am in myself. My sinful nature is bent. It's crooked. It's evil. And I thank God for his grace and his Holy Spirit that's come in and fixing me. But a self-assured saint is of no value to God. We must come to an end of ourselves because when we come to an end of ourselves, we come to the beginning of God. We're not holding on to any false sense of pride. We're just, we're just humble before him. We're laid naked and open before him. When we remember the promises that have been made in scripture and 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12. Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he falls. And then Proverbs 16, 18. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. We have to stay humble. No self-assured saint. No self-confidence. Our confidence has to be in Christ and Christ alone. Amen. The next thing we see Peter failed in is he failed to pray. Verse 45, it says, when he arose up from prayer, that's Jesus, and he came to his disciples, he found them sleeping from sorrow. And in Matthew's account, we're not going to take the time to read it, but it's in Matthew 26, verses 37 through 46. No less than three times did he come back and actually find, as he was praying in that Garden of Gethsemane, sweating drops of blood, he comes back and finds the guys sleeping three times. Three times. He was sleeping. He was sleeping. They were all sleeping. You see, when you're self-confident, you're self-dependent, and you stand in your pride, you don't see your need for prayer. I mean, what's, when, you, you know, when you're faced with a, with, with a challenge in life, what's the first thing you want to do? You know, I know inherently a lot of guys, the first thing they want to do is they just want to roll up their sleeves and solve it, just like Peter does, right? But what's the first thing we should do and need to do? Let's go to prayer. Not sleep, not depend on our own strength, but go to the Lord in prayer. Not be filled with this pride and arrogance, but seek him. Seek him. Humble people will be prayer, prayer warriors. They won't be sleeping spiritually, so to speak. They'll be prayer warriors. And then like Moses says, we're not going to make one move until the Lord moves us. Man, and we got to be there. I got to tell you, honestly, in my flesh, I just want to react sometimes, especially in regards to this, what's taking place in our culture. I can't tell you how many times I've been on the verge of just wanting to just pull a trigger, so to speak, not literally a gun, don't take me wrong, but pull a trigger in the flesh and react in the flesh and do things in the flesh and say things in the flesh and 
my wife is, can testify to this. She's heard some of the things that I've wanted to say that I've never said, because I don't want to be a man who's just trying to solve things in the flesh. We want to be people who are led by the Spirit, and we've got to stay humble upon Him. Do you guys have a healthy prayer life? I mean, I've been talking about this for a long time, and we'll continue to talk about it. Find time to make sure that you're praying and spending time humbly before Him. Before big decisions, little decisions, it doesn't matter. Just be on your face before Him. And beg him, Lord, I don't want to fall asleep spiritually. I don't want to fall asleep. I don't want to be lethargic. I want to be on my face before you humble. And in the next area that Peter fell, fell in, and the biggest problem that he was probably having at this moment is he followed at a distance. If you look at verse 54 of Luke 22, having arrested him, they led him and brought him into the high priest's house, but Peter followed at a distance. Hey, make no mistake about it. Peter loved Jesus. He had left everything to follow Jesus. There was no doubt of devotion there, and I don't have any doubt that he meant when he said, Lord, I'm ready to go to death for you, with you, both to prison, whatever it takes. I don't, I don't disbelieve that he didn't feel that way. I think he did. I think later on we'll find out that that's exactly what he did do. But what happened was, as Peter lost sight, because he followed Jesus at a distance, he lost sight of him spiritually. What does that mean? He lost sight of the cross. He lost sight of the mission that God had. That was the cross, the burial, and the resurrection. He was following at a distance. Oh, he may have been close physically, because we saw that they had an exchange, a look with each other. But spiritually, he was drifting. Spiritually, he had lost sight of understanding the full mission of God. We can too. We can too. I've been a pastor for, in the ministry and a pastor for almost 25 years, maybe a little more. And catch this, I've never met a person, not once, who just one day is like a light switch. They just said, I was following Jesus, and I'm turning the light switch off, and I'm no longer following Jesus. It's ne I've never seen it, not once. It's a slow drift. It's a slow walk away. It's following Christ at a distance, if you will. Oh, and it's subtle. It's subtle. First, you lose sight of the mission. You start thinking the mission of a church is to solve all my problems and to meet every single one of my needs or felt needs. You think God, and maybe some ways you lose sight of this, and you think he's a magic genie. And so I prayed for something to take place, and maybe you were praying for a loved one to get healed and get well, and they didn't. They ended up dying, so you become angry and bitter. I've seen this with people who've lost children. They lost sight of the mission. They didn't understand that God had a bigger picture with everything. And, boy, I'll tell you what, there's so many times when we're facing so many struggles in life, and, I, and, and, and in my heart, I just have to, as I'm going through these struggles, just remind myself, God, you have a plan and a purpose. You have a plan and a purpose. You have a plan and a purpose. What, even if the enemy is meaning this for evil, you're going to turn it around for good. Amen? We can't lose sight of that mission. But spiritually, we start to drift, and we start to, we lose sight of that mission, and, and then we just start to drift. We start to look at things of the world, and we get enticed by them again. Maybe we get more involved with work and hobbies and recreational activities and we replace our time that would have been in the word and prayer and fellowship with other believers with pursuing those things. We've lost our first love. And it's a slow drift, slow, like a drippy faucet. This doesn't happen overnight. But this is what happens when we, when we follow Jesus at a distance. When trials come, when temptations come, when struggles come, you know what you and I need to do? We need to press in to Jesus, not follow at a distance. Press in. Keep pressing in. Understand he's got a perfect plan. Understand that you may not understand it ever in this life. Understand that we don't even really need to ask questions, Lord, I don't understand why. We can ask it, but it really get to the point where we just say, I trust you. 
I know you're going to do something good through this for your glory, for your glory. And somehow because of Romans 8, 28, you're going to work it all out in my life for good as well. So guys, don't follow Jesus at a distance. Press in, stay in the word, stay in prayer, and stay in fellowship. I know right now we're having to meet on a silly computer. And it's really, I, I thank God for it. Please don't ever misunderstand me. But electronic church, or whatever you call this church here, is like taking an electronic vacation or having an electronic wife. It's just, we got to get back together. And the command that Jesus gave in Hebrews 10, 24, and 25, and do not, and excuse me, and let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much more as you see the day approaching. My goodness, guys, is the day approaching? All the stuff that I've been reading about and teaching about all these years, and we're living in these days right now. A little scary, but also extremely exciting, amen? So as the day is approaching, we need to get back together. I don't know what that's going to look like in the weeks to come, but I do know that it's going to have to change soon. Not that I want to be disobedient. I don't want to lose our witness with the government, but God has commanded us to be together. And there are only certain things that can take place when we are together. Some friends of ours stopped by last week after we did the live screen here. First of all, before we hung up on the Zoom call, they said, uh, I think we might just crash. And I said, I'll never close the door to anybody. <laughs> never. Guys, I don't know if there's a hidden message in that. Um, but then they texted after the Zoom call ended, hey, we're on our way down. And we sat here, I don't know, maybe two, two, three, three, three o'clock just talking. There was a fullness and a blessing in the fellowship that takes place. So we need to get better back together soon. And soon it will be. Soon it will be. Now let's look at our next main point, the results of Peter's denial. Look at verse 55 of Luke 22 with me. And when they had kindled a fire in the midst of the courtyard and sat down together, Peter sat among them. And a certain servant girl, seeing him as he sat by the fire, looked intently at him and said, This man was also with him. But he denied him, saying, Woman, I do not know him. And after a little while, another saw him and said, You also are of them. But Peter said, Man, I am not. That after about an hour had passed, another confidently affirmed, saying, Surely this fellow also was with him, for he is a Galilean. But Peter said, Man, I do not know what you are saying. And immediately while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed. So here's Peter, following at a distance. And what do you do when you follow at a distance? You start to begin to sit down with those who wanted Jesus crucified. This is a natural process of life. We see it in Psalm 1. In Psalm 1, it's, in Psalm 1, 1, it says, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. See, what Peter had done by not staying spiritually and, 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 and even more so physically close to Christ at that moment, he started to turn and drift towards the world. And that's why Psalm 1 says, you're blessed if you don't do these things. But you see the progression in Psalm 1, 1 is that it, who, who walks in the council of Godly. See, this is where Peter stepped in. He started to hang out with him. He's sitting at the fire with him. Instead of pressing into Christ, he was hanging out with the world and he started listening to the world. And that could be our tendency as well when trials come and, and, and maybe God doesn't meet whatever expectation. He didn't come through as our magic genie. And then all of a sudden we start listening to the counsel of the world again. We start listening to ungodly advice. We start listening to things that we should not be listening to. And heeding. And it's a slow drip because then it leads to hanging out with them. As Psalm says there, hey, 
you're starting to not, you don't want to listen to the counsel of godly, but then you start to stand with the ungodly in the path. You start to stand with them. You start to hang out with them. You start to go back into the same habits you were in before. To dwell with, to hang out, to, 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 to really become a part of again. This is what was happening to Peter. And then you full on join them because now you start to become a scornful and a mocker. And what did Peter do? Three times. I do not know him. I do not know him. I do not know him. And actually we know that he cursed He cursed. He became scornful. The process of drifting. I start listening to the world. I start hanging out with the world. And then I start becoming a mocker, just like the world. And this is where Peter is at. This is where Peter's at. How many of you have been there? Maybe there's some watching on Facebook now. I'm not sure who's watching. So I'm not pointing any fingers at anybody. Don't yell at me. Don't write me any emails. Maybe you're in this spot where you started to listen to the world. You started to hang out with the world. And now you're cursing and mocking God and you're just checking this out. Look, there's hope. You don't need to stay there. You don't need to stay there. You can repent and get back and be right with God. And that leads us to our next main point, the restoration of Peter. Look at verse 61 of Luke 22. And the Lord turned and looked at Peter, and then Peter remembered the words of the Lord, how he had said before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. The drama of that scene, I can only just imagine in my heart and in my head. But here you got Peter, who was just boldly proclaiming, I'll go to death with you. Jesus is arrested. You know, maybe maybe Peter, you know, with that part of his motivation and cutting off the ear was is that, hey, I'm ready to go all the way to battle. And then when Peter saw that Jesus didn't fight back and the way he thought he was going to fight back, that kind of caused Peter to just shudder a little bit and didn't know what was going on because he missed the spiritual mission of what God was all about. But then he's denied him three times. He hears the rooster and he goes, uh-oh. <laughs> oh, boy. The Lord told me this. Lord told me this. He told me this is going to happen. And what do you think that looked like? You know, that, that, that look, that look that he got from Jesus. What do you think that look was? You know, was it a look of, oh, you're an idiot, Peter. I, I can't believe it. You just need to just go away. I'm done with you. I'm finished. You're dead to me. No, I don't think that was Jesus' look whatsoever. I think Jesus' look was a look of Peter. I already told you this was going to happen. And I want you to remember what else I told you after that was going to happen. Because I want to use you. I know you feel like a failure right now. And yes, you have failed, but you're not a failure because I'm going to restore you and I'm going to put you back on track and I'm going to make sure that you accomplish what it is that I've set forth in your life to accomplish. Same thing is with us, guys. You may feel like you've drifted miles away. Let me tell you something. Jesus is just one nanosecond call away from healing and restoration. That doesn't mean he's going to take away all the consequences from our behavior, but it does mean that there's going to be a spiritual healing that is so much greater than the physical world. And he doesn't look at you with shame. He doesn't say, you're dead to me. He looks at you and says, I know your wanderings. And I know you're prone to wander. But my love is greater. Will you please come back to me? Will you please remember the words I have said to you? Will you please remember Luke 22, 32? But I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. And when you have returned to me, strengthen your brethren. I already told you you were going to fail. Now get back up. And I love Psalm 56, verse 8. You number my wanderings. Put my tears into your bottle. And are and are, are they not in your book? He knows our wanderings. He knows our flesh, for crying out loud. He knows that we're prone to stumble. He knows So if you have stumbled and you're living in this life of, I don't think I can ever get back, 
listen, that I don't think I can ever get back is a lie from Satan. Shut it off and turn on the promises of God. Remember the fact that you were saved by grace, not by anything you did. Romans 5, 8 says he loved us when we were still sinners. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and not of yourself, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. If you have failed, you've got grace to come back and remember our favorite verse. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, what is he? He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all our unrighteousness. This is not a license to sin. If you truly understand grace, you don't want to sin. You don't want to sin. You don't want to take advantage of it. But if you've sinned and you feel like there's no way back, that's a lie from Satan. Just come back. Repent. Come back. And so, verse 22, I mean, verse 62 of chapter 22, Peter wept out, uh, went out and wept bitterly. We know this is a a, 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 a tears of, of uh, repentance. How do we know that? Because of the fruit that it bore afterwards. Because Peter got back up on the, the, the ministry wagon, so to speak, and kept moving forward. We know that when Judas felt sorry for himself, he may have been with tears, it may have been with whatever, but guess what? <clears throat> it didn't bear out because what did he do? He went and hung himself. If he was generally repentive, don't you think Christ would have restored him? Absolutely. Absolutely. So we know that Peter's weeping. We know that we can sometimes you know, weep and not be repentant, but we know that Peter's was weeping for repentance. And that's sort of the restoration. And in order to do this, I just want to look at a few verses elsewhere in the Bible. Mark chapter 16, verse 7. I love this. But go tell his disciples, and then Mark makes this mention, and Peter, that he is going before you into Galilee, there you will see him as he said you would. See, the angel makes a special mention of Peter. Peter is singled out because of what he's just done in, in, this, in this, is this moment of Jesus' arrest. He's sitting around the fire denying him three times, and the angel just makes a special mention and says, hey, make sure Peter knows. Make sure he knows. And then how can we forget if you don't have your Bible, if you don't have the notes in front of you, turn in your Bible to John 21. We're going to zero in. We just want to read this. And I'll make a few little comments. But this is what's taking place. They're on the Sea of Galilee. Peter's gone back, what? To fishing again. <laughs> and Jesus comes to restore Peter and to let Peter know that it's okay. You need to get back up and you need to go. So in verse 15 of chapter 21 of John, and so... When he had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Agape is the word used, more than these. And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Not using the same word agape, phileo. And he said to him, feed my lambs. And then in verse 16, he said to him a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know I love you. And he said to him, tend my sheep. And he said to him a third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Every word that Jesus used was agape. Every use Peter word was not agape. And I'm just, I forgot where I was. And Jesus said to him, Lord, you know all things. Let me just read verse 17 all over again since I forgot where I was. He said to him a third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? And Peter was grieved because he said to him a third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my lambs. Most assuredly, I say to you, when you were younger, you girded yourself and walked where you wished. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hand and another will, will gird you and carry you where you do not wish. This he spoke, signifying by what death he would glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said to him, follow me. A complete restoration of Peter. Peter had fallen. He denied the Lord. He cursed 
night and denied the Lord. And look at what the Savior does. The Savior desires to bring him back. And the Savior does. And he tells him to get back up, not only in a relationship with him, but get up and go feed my sheep. All right. Now turn to Acts 2. We have all got to turn to Acts 2 because I didn't put those in your notes. But this, to me, is absolutely off the charts amazing. Okay, so we see the scene. He's denied Jesus. He's cursed that he's known Jesus. He's drifted. He's walked away. We do see him come back around the resurrection, running to the tomb. John was a faster runner. Um, we see him, though, with the rest of the disciples, basically cowering. You know, I mean, they're waiting for the Holy Spirit, but they're also still cowering a little bit because they don't have the boldness of the Holy Spirit upon them yet. And so in Acts 1, we see the Holy Spirit, the dudamous power from God, comes upon the apostles, and they now have boldness to speak. And now we see this man, Peter. And if you look at chapter 2 of Acts, look in at verse 14. What does Peter do now that he's been fully restored and fully anointed by the Holy Spirit? But Peter, standing up in the midst of the eleven, raised his voice and said to them, Men of Judah and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you, and heed my words. <laughs> heed my words. The same Peter who was so sheepish, who was so embarrassingly denied Jesus just a little while ago, is now standing up in front of all the men in Judah, I mean in Jerusalem and Judah, and saying to them, Heed these words. Now, we're not going to read all of it, but just jump down to verse 22. Listen to what he says. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did through him in your midst, as you yourself also know, him being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands and have crucified and put to death, whom God raised, having loosed the pains of death, because it is not possible that he should be held by it. I think he's fully restored. What do you guys think? <laughs> I love that. There's a boldness there. You have crucified him. You have lawless hands raised against our Savior. You have done this. Now he's going to go in to repent. He wants them to come to Christ. Thousands come to Christ on this day of Pentecost, don't they? See, that's the restoration God wants to bring to us. And then we know, as we talked about in John there, speaking of his death, tradition says that he was actually crucified upside down. Tradition states that he said, I, will, I am not worthy to be crucified in the same manner in which my Lord was crucified. Please crucify me upside down. See, that's what God wants to do. If you've drifted, if you've wandered, if, if you're in that moment, just repent and he wants to restore you. He wants to give you a boldness. He wants to give you the strength that you need to keep following him. Oh, yeah, by the way, Peter had to watch his wife die before he could go be with her and be with the Lord. So here we have, guys, a beautiful promise, an exhortation and a beautiful promise. The exhortation is don't drift. Don't follow Jesus at a distance. Stay close. Press in. No matter what's going on in your life, keep pressing into Christ. No matter where this world's going, and I'm going to tell you something, it's going into some crazy places. You got churches, government overreach taking place in churches right now. All kinds of things that I just don't want to go into in this message, but we need to not just cower. We need to press in. And we need to be bold for Christ. Not rude, but bold for Christ. We don't want to lose our witness. We want to stay. We want to stay with the right heart and with the right attitude. So don't drift. Stay close. Keep in prayer. Read God's word. Stay humble. Allow the Holy Spirit to move in your hearts and in your life. Fellowship with other believers. Share Jesus Christ with unbelievers. We have an incredible opportunity at this time to share the love of Christ with people who are weary, who are lost hope, who are on the verge of losing everything because of what our government is doing right now. Stay the course. Stay the course. And if you have drifted, if you have fallen, get back up. Christ's grace, his love is greater than your capacity to sin. Amen.
we're going to receive communion here, but I want to pray. The worship team's going to come up and lead in the song, and then Vic's going to lead us in communion, and then I'll come up after Vic is done. Lord, we love you. We thank you. We praise you, Lord. Give us the strength that we need to stand in the day that you've called us to stand. As Esther said, it's for such a time as this that we are here. And Lord, if if we're battling sin and we're still stuck in sin, then we're not going to be able to stand. And so, Lord, we confess our sins and we receive afresh and anew your grace. And Lord, we receive afresh and anew the baptism of your Holy Spirit and empowering to go and be a witness for you. Not in our own strength, Lord, but in your power, in your strength, and in your might. Because it's not by our power, and it is not by our strength, it is not by our might, but it is by all those things in you. It's by your Holy Spirit living and working in our hearts. So, Lord, help us. Help us to just keep pressing into you. We love you, Lord, and it's in your name we pray. Amen.